Hello and welcome tonight. The federal government vehemently rejects EU conclusions on 2023 general elections, says it is biased and largely unfounded. The president set to continue tackling the challenges of governance as he returns to Abuja after five days Eid holiday in Lagos. World Bank country director Shubham Chaudhry joins us tonight, gives perspective on how Nigeria should prevent growing poverty as a result of fuel subsidy removal. And after almost a week of protests, grandmother of 17-year-old French citizen whose death sparked demonstrations is calling for end to the riots. We begin tonight with the story of the federal government strongly rejecting the European Union's conclusions of the 2023 general elections. The presidency, in its appraisal of the EU reports which identified flaws in the polls, explains that the 2023 general elections, given all parameters, were free, fair, peaceful and won by President Bola Tinubu. The EU, in its final report, indicated that the shortcomings in law and electoral administration hindered the conduct of well-run and inclusive elections and damaged trust in INEC. They also identified lack of transparency and operational failures, which, according to them, reduced trust in the process and challenged the right to vote. The government, in its response, says there is no substantial evidence provided by the European Union or any foreign and local organization that is viable enough to impeach the integrity of the 2023 election outcomes. A statement by the Special Advisor to the President on Special Duties, a Communications and Strategy, Mr. Dela Lake reads in part, now that the organization has submitted what it claims to be its final report on the elections, we can now categorically let Nigerians and the entire world know that we were not unaware of the machinations of the European Union to sustain its largely unfounded bias and claims on the election outcomes. The government insists that Nigeria, as a sovereign state, knows how to organize itself, adding that the EU-EOM final report on Nigeria's recent elections is a product of a poorly done desk job that relied heavily on few instances of skirmishes in less than 1,000 polling units out of, out of over 176,000 where Nigerians voted on election day. Another part of the statement reads, Unlike EU-EOM that deployed fewer than 50 observers, the Nigerian Bar Association that sent out over 1,000 observers spread across the entire country for the same election gave a more holistic and accurate assessment of the elections in their own report. The presidential jet of President Bola Tinubu touching down at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport in Abuja. To welcome him is the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, George Akume, the National Security Advisor, Nuhu Ribadu, the service chiefs, including the Inspector General of Police, Kayode Egbetokun. The President spent five days in Lagos observing the Eid holiday. And indeed, for five days, the president was in Lagos, where he spent his Eid, ol Eid holidays, as you already know. But the president's stay in the nation's commercial nerve center was very eventful, as he joined other Muslims at the Dordan Barracks praying ground at Obalende and hosted the Guinean president before departing Lagos today. Here's the president's itinerary in Lagos. The presidential wing of the Motala Mohammed International Airport, friends, political associates and close aides to the president, all here to honor the president as he departs to Abuja. The traditional guard of honor mounted by the Nigerian military. The 
The president's holiday was not entirely for rest, as in the last five days, he's been engaged in several activities within and outside Lagos, including joining Muslim faithful for Eid prayers at Dodden Barracks, a visit to the Awujale of Ijebu land, or Basikiru Adetono, and the Alaki of Egba land, or Ba Adedotsun Badibod III. At the palace of the Awujale, the president explains the challenges he faced during his campaign. To invoke the spirit of freedom for which I took that spirit twice. The spirit of Baba is a miracle. The president was hosted to the state banquet by the Lagos state governor, Babajide Sawolu, and he also hosted his Guinean counterpart. As he settles in to work, one of the immediate expectations from the president is the appointment of more aides and nominees for his cabinet, the daunting issues of economic revival, as well as the security of the country. With the removal of petrol subsidy, the federal government is expected to save an average of about 400 billion naira, and that's according to the socio-economic rights and accountability project, SEREP. And this is why the rights group is asking the Bola Tinubu administration to urgently per publish details of spending of about 400 billion naira so far saved as a result of the removal of subsidy on petrol. SEREP is also asking for details of specific projects on which the funds will be spent on and the mechanisms that have been put in place to ensure that any such savings are not embezzled or misappropriated. In a letter, Serap maintains that Nigerians have the right to know how the savings are spent, and publishing the details of the spending of the savings will engender transparency, accountability, and also reduce the risks, the risks of corruption in the spending of the funds. For more on the loans for Nigeria, I'm now joined on the News at 10 by the World Bank Country Director to Nigeria, Mr. Shubham Chaudhry. Thank you for joining us on the News at 10. Good evening. Good to be here. Yes, indeed. So the World Bank has been Nigeria's development partner for many years. Give us a background on the years of collaboration and how effective ad has been. Let's start with that. So yes, so Nigeria is like 188 other countries, a member and a shareholder, meaning an owner of the World Bank. And our basic mission everywhere in all the countries in which we work is to help the countries eliminate extreme poverty, make lives better for people in a sustainable way. So that's what we've been trying to do here in Nigeria. We work through government, both at the federal and at the subnational level, meaning with the states, which are responsible for doing most of what ordinary Nigerians are looking for from their government. You know, having good primary health care, basic education for all children, rural roads so farmers can get to their markets, basic electricity access, so jobs, economic opportunities that you know, young Nigerians can aspire to. So our, what we try to do is help finance, but also support through ideas from other countries, government programs that will do these things, that will deliver these basic services, that will provide rural electricity or roads. Um, and we try to do this in a way that ensures that there's value for money. The financing that the World Bank provides is, is a loan. It's a highly concessional loan, but it is still a loan that Nigeria will have to pay back over a number of years. So part of what we try to do is we're working closely with government partners, but also with civil society and other stakeholders, ensure that these programs are well implemented, that the funds are used for the purposes that they were intended, and that the communities and, and the final beneficiaries, intended beneficiaries, do actually see the value of how these funds are spent. All right, so the World Bank has strongly advocated for fuel subsidy removal. 
Now that it has been done, Nigerians are beginning to feel the pinch or are feeling the pinch with high rising costs leading to more suffering. Don't you think this is counterintuitive in the sense that the poor don't seem to be benefiting from this action? So you're absolutely right that there has been pain, that Nigerians, ordinary Nigerians, are seeing prices go up, transport prices of, you know, if you're trying to get to work from one of the satellite towns around Abuja, the price of commuting every day has probably doubled, if not tripled. Uh, so certainly there has been a pain. The basic point to remember, though, is that this pain was necessary as a part of almost like an emergency surgery to stop the hemorrhaging of the Federation's finances. Funds, 400 billion naira per month, that could have been used for primary health care, that could have been used for basic education, for just to ensure law and order and security all around the country, was instead being used to finance something that where the benefits were mostly being realized by the rich or across the borders. So undoubtedly, in the short term, there has been and will be pain, but it is all in the interest of a longer term gain, which is to enable the Nigerian government, again, both at the federal and at the state levels, to truly invest in Nigeria's people, to invest in the infrastructure that communities need, and to ultimately enable you know, those private investment to come in and create the jobs that Nigerians are looking for. So part of the challenge going forward for the government, and here's where you know, we've been trying to help and provide some ideas and support from other countries, is how can you alleviate at least some of the pain that ordinary Nigerians are feeling as Nigeria goes towards a much better future where those longer term gains will be realized. All right, Mr. Chaudhry, uh, recently we had the Global Financial Pact Summit in Paris. And of course, African leaders uh, were asking for a fairness in terms of uh, the interest rates uh, that uh, uh, African countries will be uh, asking when they, whenever they come to the World Bank or indeed uh, the Western world for uh, these uh, uh, loans. But particularly African leaders are saying that uh, why can't we have grants and perhaps moratorium? Why loans? Uh, don't you think uh, that can uh, uh, also help impact in the situation, particularly uh, with Nigeria as a case study? So I think here again, you know, it's about trade-offs. I'm an economist and economics is essentially uh, kind of a discipline that looks at trade-offs. You know, there are always, if you do one thing, it means you may not be able to do something else. So the trade-off in, in this particular case is to enable the World Bank to have the financing to provide, to continue to provide financing into the future. So imagine if we had Okay, one billion dollars that we can use to support Nigeria and other African countries. If we were to give it all out in grants right today, we would do that once and we would be done. Instead, if we were to give it, as we do in the case of Nigeria, as a 30-year loan at a very low interest rate, it's about 2.5% per year, with an initial grace period of between 8 and 10 years, what that means is that effectively it is in many ways like a grant because it's about, it's, that's why it's called highly concessional, but there is some repayment which then enables us to continue to provide this kind of concessional financing going forward. So that really is the trade-off. Now, I think everyone would agree that it would be great to have a world where we were able to provide even more concessional financing. And believe me, from my perspective as country director for Nigeria, I trying to make that case all the time. How can we get more concessional financing, not just for Nigeria, but for other sub-Saharan African countries, but ultimately that financing for it to be concessional and not commercial, it has to, the, the, has to come from somewhere. So that's where governments in other countries have to decide and taxpayers in other countries have to decide, yes, we want to do this. And that's part of the, also what we try to do, to help make the case why it is in the interest on the, of the global community to provide this kind of concessional financing so that countries like Nigeria, Nigeria is the largest country in Africa, is the biggest economy in Africa, Nigeria's success will determine where the region, the continent goes. So to help Nigeria succeed, it is in the interest of other countries 
to expand the pool of concessional financing. But in the meantime, I think we continue to try and provide as much concessional financing, but it will be as a credit rather than as a grant. All right, Mr. Shubham Chaudhry, thank you so much for your thoughts on the news at 10. We thank you so much once again. Thank you. In part two after the break, former governor of Edo State, Adam Shashamala, says if he had lost the senatorial election, he would have developed high blood pressure. That's in a moment. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the News at 10, coming to you live from Channels Television. A reminder of our top stories. The federal government vehemently rejects EU conclusions on 2023 general elections, says it is biased and largely unfounded. The president set to continue tackling the challenges of governance as he returns to Abuja after five days Eid holiday in Lagos. World Bank country director Shubham Chaudhry has been given his perspective on what Nigeria should do to prevent growing poverty as a result of fuel subsidy removal. And after almost a week of protests, grandmother of 17-year-old French citizen whose death sparked demonstrations is calling for end to the riots. and former governor of Edo State, Mr. Adams Rashomale, believes he would have developed high blood pressure if he had lost his senatorial bid. Mr. Rashomale was reflecting on the different positions to his ambition at the reception held for him in his hometown, Iyamo, in Isako West local government area of Edo State. He says he's confident that he will give proper account of himself as a senator representing his people in the 10th Assembly. If you have voted against me, I don't know if my blood pressure now will be 240 over 360, if I'm still alive. Because the stipulation by the opponent of the church, that they will come and knock my small down and break my small bone. But you said no. And I have a message from the president. Yesterday, he was hosted by Lagos State Government. And every Saturday, he received us to celebrate his ED. He has particular interest in Edo State because from the primaries, Edo people were with him through Edo candidates. And in the elections, the young people were with him in the manner that they voted. So he's very, very appreciative. Bishop of Sokoto Catholic Diocese Matthew Kuka is asking the federal government to enforce the provision of freedom of religion and worship as enshrined in the nation's constitution by providing adherents of different faiths in the country with places of worship in the various federal government establishments across the country. The bishop who spoke to journalists shortly after the inaugural mass at the Catholic chaplaincy of the 119 composite group of the Nigeria Air Force Sokoto emphasized the importance of these places of worship that enable personnel to freely practice their religion. It should be federal government law that everywhere there's federal government presence, universities, polytechnics, hospitals, federal medical centers, army formations there should be and there has always been since the early 70s a catholic church protestant church and a mosque but in many parts of nigeria this is not lived according to the law uh, which is why it has taken us this is the first time we're gathering here now to celebrate uh, uh, the holy mass i took up this conversation with the former uh, chief of uh, air staff 
and it did make us a promise. So this is not, uh, it's actually, by not making these facilities available, all the federal universities, all the federal hospitals, all the, fo the federal government formations everywhere in Nigeria uh, are in breach of the law. They are in breach of the spirit of the constitution that allows Christians, Muslims, believers to practice their faith. But in many places, especially in northern Nigeria, this, this has not been... So I would like to call on the federal government because it's a question of enforcement. The provisions are there. Every federal university has provision for the building of a church, the building of a mosque, building of... So this is nothing new. And um, our rights are enshrined in the constitution. We shouldn't be begging for those rights to be enforced. To Imo State now, and the electorate are gearing up for the off-cycle governorship election scheduled for November this year. For that reason, the National Peace Committee, as part of its desire for the conduct of free and fair election, is engaging citizens of the state and political parties on free election process. The Peace Committee held a town hall meeting in Uweri, the Imo State capital. A peaceful election is central to national stability and enhancement of the democratic process. And the National Peace Committee is not taking anything for granted as it meets with key sectors in Imo State ahead of the November 11 election. The two-day town hall meeting organized by the Kuka Center is looking at having a peaceful election, conduct of free and fair process, and ensuring safety of all. We are doing that a lot of states peace at have been organized at the state level, especially for the With the theme, deepening participation and amplifying citizens' voices, the meeting is also providing a platform to highlight strategies that will promote the ideals of social cohesion during the entire process, and the politicians themselves seem to understand what is at stake. I mean, a lot have been said. Kuka Foundation have, in fact, the resource persons have, have been so wonderful. If we can imbibe what they have taught us in this two days conference, I'm, believe, I'm believing that we are good to go. What do you gain from election violence? If you lose your life, what happens? In 2019, we programmed around election violence. I brought somebody who's been carrying ballot box since 1991. And he says after carrying ballot box for politicians, they change their phone numbers and he would have been killed. Okay, so when these kind of questions are beginning to ask, then we, we are sure something will come out. But you know the most critical role? The media. If you tell people there's no benefit in election violence, they will buy into it. They will listen to you. It has become a tradition that before elections are held, the National Peace Committee brings every participant on board by making them sign the peace pact, accepting to abide the outcome of the elections. However, at the end of the elections, the outcome, in most cases, become controversial. There are concerns over the status of monetary assets and liabilities of the Nigerian government. Tonight, our focus is on getting the accurate picture of how much the country owes, especially to multilaterals such as the World Bank. Baba Jidil Gusol, founder of Leadership by Data and Channels Television's data analyst, is here to share the facts about existing and new loans from the World Bank. Baba Jidil, it's great to have you again on the News at 10. Good evening, Ayo today. All right, let's get into it very quickly. How much does the country owe the World Bank, and is there anything at all to worry about? Uh, first is...
with your second question, yes, there's something to worry about, and I'll explain that in a bit. Um, how much does Nigeria owe the World Bank? Your first question. The numbers that we have shows that Nigeria owes the World Bank $14 billion. Those are the numbers. Say that again. $14 billion. Okay. Now, you ask, is there something to worry about? I'd like us to answer that question together by taking a look at the facts in the last seven years. Because the evidence shows that even the World Bank, if we take a look at the numbers, even the World Bank is now cautious about lending to Nigeria. And I'll explain this. In June 2015, Nigeria's external debt was $10.3 billion. Out of the $10.3 billion, $6.1 billion came from the World Bank. In simple terms, as of June 2015, 60% of all of Nigeria's external debt came from the World Bank. Between June 2015 to the end of last year, seven years, we've seen Nigeria's external debt more than quadrupled, so from $10.3 billion to $41 billion. However, the World Bank is now more cautious. In simple terms, today, Nigeria's approximately $42 billion external debt. The World Bank only accounts for 33% of those borrowings. So in simple terms, what we are saying is that Nigeria is borrowing so much more, but the World Bank is not borrowing Nigeria as much as it is borrowing. Again, 2015, 60% of all Nigeria's external debt came from the World Bank. Now we're in a situation where less than half, in fact, the numbers from the central bank shows that, and from the debt management office shows that only 33% of our external borrowings as of today is coming from the World Bank. In other words, the World Bank, yes, is borrowing Nigeria more, but it's being more cautious. So Nigeria is now having to rely more on groups such as um, China and its euro bond. The World Bank, I repeat, is even becoming more cautious in lending to Nigeria. Those are what the numbers show. Mm. So tell me, have loans been significant to Nigeria's growth and development? I mean, what are the facts? concerning that? You know, th this is an area that I've been working on for over a decade, and the numbers shows that the loans are not creating the sort of impact on the growth of the economy. Let's take, at, let's take a look at the exact numbers about why I assert that external loans are not impacting the economy. I right, look at what's in front of you. As at the end of 2015, Nigeria's domestic debt was 8.8 .8 trillion naira. Between 2015 and the end of 2022, our domestic debt has grown by 51%, from 8.8 .8 trillion naira domestic debt to 22 trillion naira as of today, 151% growth, only on domestic debt. Now, let's take a look at our, our debt position. End of 2015, $7.3 billion. As at the end of last year, 37 dollars Billion dollars again, external debt growing by 407 percent. So, keep a look at those two columns domestic debt 151 percent in seven years, external debt over 400 percent in seven years. Our economic growth, Ayo, eight percent, eight percent economic growth only despite domestic debt borrowing growing by 151 percent. External debt going by 407%, yet economy grew only by 8%. And that is according to the National Bureau of Statistics. So the question we need to ask ourselves is that what exactly are we using companies to do that seems to be unproductive? Because a lot of borrowings have happened domestic and external, yet the economy isn't seeing rapid economic growth. So now the government to save so much money from the uh, subsidy savings. Now, will this reduce the thirst for the borrowing? I mean, domestic and external? The evidence shows it, it, it wouldn't. Um, it wouldn't because our rev revenue is not even really growing. And so that is why the government is borrowing. Revenue seems to be growing, but the fact shows that revenue is moving slowly. Again, the numbers speaks for itself. Let's take a look at the revenue of the federal government since 2015. And if we take a look at those numbers again, Ayo, 2015, the government generated 3.4 billion, and that's the federal government, 3.4 billion 
according to the central bank. 2016 less, 3.1 billion naira. 2017 even less, 2.8 billion naira. The estimates from the central bank today shows that last year, 2022, we generated 5.6 billion naira. Now, Ayo, that seems to be some good news, but here's the bad news. 3.4 billion naira in 2015 to 5.6 billion naira in 2022. That looks like some good news. 65% revenue growth seems to be good news. The bad news is between that same period, inflation rates 115%. In simple terms, the 3.4 billion naira of 2015 was worth more or is worth more than the 5.6 billion naira of 2022. The summary about what is in front of you is within seven years, we've seen a lot of motion but little or no movement. Again, 3.4 billion naira in 2015 as government revenue is, much, is worth much more than the 5.6 billion naira revenue we generated last year. So the summary of tonight's discussion really for me is that over seven years, we've been penny wise, pound foolish in the words of Robert Burton. I will definitely leave it at that. Baba Jidogu, so thank you again for your thoughts on the news at 10. Ayotunde, the pleasure is always mine. Let's head to Zamfara State, where residents have, are asking or demanding the administration of Governor Dauda Lawal and other elected officials to prioritize security and education for the people. At a town hall meeting organized by Zamfara Circle Community Initiative in Guzo, the state capital, Residents engage both the executive and indeed the federal lawmakers representing the various constituencies in the state on the need to provide basic amenities for residents, especially those living in the rural communities. In what many describe as the biggest political upset in the 2023 general election, the People's Democratic Party candidate, Dauda Lawal, defeated an incumbent governor of the All Progressives Congress, Bello Matawali, making Governor Matawali the only sitting governor to lose his re-election bid. Determined to seal new Zamfara state after the inauguration of the newly elected public officials in the state, residents have set an agenda and a roadmap for the new administration in the state. Education, security, youth empowerment, health and economy, among others, are identified as critical areas that need urgent attention from the new administration in the state. Federal lawmaker representing Gumi Bukuyum Federal Constituency commended the Zamfara Circle Community Initiative for the interactive session with members of the public, noting that the mandate is now with the elected representatives as the actions will determine what will happen in the 2027 general election. The ulamas really brought our attention to the need to listen to the people, you know, and uh, widen your consultations, not to take uh, unilateral decisions. You have to consult. Even if you, you, you think your, your idea is good, you need to still consult with uh, your constituents and even advisors. The Zamfara state governor, who was represented by the secretary to the state government, highlights the plans already made by the government on some of the issues raised. The new administration is resolutely committed to implementing people-centered policies and programs that prioritize the needs of the citizens. This is by extension, uh, it's going to be bottom-top approach with the people taking center stage and taking ownership of what concerns them. This is to ensure accountability and transparency in the way we do things. We will soon unveil a new security strategy to combat banditry and other criminal activities. We will explore in Allah all available options to restore peace and security to our communities, working closely with security agencies and engaging with local communities for support and cooperation. Amidst growing concern over the security situation in Zamfara State, Residents are optimistic that the new administration will summon the political will to overcome the challenges bedeviling the state. Reports from the United Nations reveal that substandard drugs kill around 500,000 persons in sub-Saharan Africa annually. Of that number, at least 267,000 are linked to falsified and substandard prescription 
of drugs. In Kano State, drug abuse prevalence has been pegged at 16%, with one out of every six persons believed to be addicted to drugs and aged between 15 to 64 years old. In this next report, our correspondent, Nanshin Vincent, examines the situation and the impact on some victims of counterfeit drugs. A recent report by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes records that substandard drugs kill at least 500,000 persons in sub-Saharan Africa each year. Kano State is recorded as having an abuse prevalence at 16%. Many residents of the metropolis fell victim of the proliferation of fake drugs and the state government thought to intervene. It set up systems to ensure only genuine drugs are sold in Kano. One, you have to know the manufacturer. Secondly, proper address of that manufacturer, is it existing? Or is just you cannot find where this address is being said? The fraud must be duly registered by NABDAC. As purposeful as the government's efforts were, some fake drugs slipped through. Some Kano residents lament the effects of substandard drugs and their experiences. My experience with fake drugs was when I bought Spectol and I saw cotton wood inside. It's uncalled for. When I bought the drugs today, because I normally open it and pour the powder in my mouth. So on doing that, and I was not feeling that test of penicillin and that ampiclos when you pour drugs on your mouth, how it feels. It's just as if I poured chalk on my mouth. Kano State government applauds the support from professional bodies and well-meaning Nigerians in the form of new pharmacy at the oldest hospital in Kano, the Sheikh Mohammed Jida General Hospital and the recent international drug market in the States. On behalf of the government of Ghana State, all the on association, also association to support the criminalization of the recently commissioned coordinated wholesale center at Nangoru. The establishment of this center, which is the first of its kind in the country, will sanitize the chaotic drug distribution Across the state. President of the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria and the management are confident that the proliferation of fake drugs will end in Kano. Uh, what we witness here is quite monumental, particularly when this hospital was the first in 1913. And somehow, not to neglect, but it's been remodeled, uh, is touching base with the downtrodden, those who will really benefit. Kano State has about 2 million drug users abusing tramadol, codeine and others. This has led to several health problems and even death. Kano residents are concerned and hope that more can be done to fight the scourge of substandard drugs. From Kano Commercial City, Nancy and Vincent, Channels Television News. To some sad news, a pastor of a redeemed Christian Church of God has been killed while seven church members abducted when gunmen stormed the church in Abuliori area of Obafemi Wode local government of Ogun State during a vigil. The commander of the Ogun State So Safe Corps, Soji Gonzalo, confirmed the incident in Abekuta, the state capital today. However, he said that his officers have rescued the seven church members and killed one of the kidnappers during an encounter after the abduction. He adds that the joint team of the police and the SoSafe Corps have already launched a manhunt for the fleeing suspected kidnappers. Every country has its own policy on the issuance of work permit, otherwise known as work visa, needed by every foreigner to take up a job in the country of residence. And for some strange reason, there has been challenges by some foreigners to secure work permits in Nigeria. The Nigerian Immigration Service is stepping in to checkmate the delays or difficulties faced by foreigners. This has been addressed as the Nigerian Immigration Service held an interactive session with some expatriates in Port Harcourt, River State, on how to resolve the difficulties surrounding the issuance of work visas. Bottlenecks encountered by expatriates who either work or intend to work in Nigeria is generating concern among stakeholders, including the relevant government agency, the Nigeria Immigration Service. At this immigration workshop on sensitization and liberalization of operations and investment held in Port Harcourt, the River State capital, the agency says it is committed to tackle the issue of work visa for these expatriates. The Control of Immigration in River State, Mr. Sunday James, explains its intent to ensure companies with expatriates working in the country don't break the law. 
Why we invited them here is for them to be able to understand where we are going to and where we are coming from. And as a new controller in the state, I must know my stakeholders. They must know me. They should also understand immigration responsibility that's on their head, so that we will not, they will not default and then will not be blamed. So sanction is permitted where somebody knows, because there's no ignorance. Uh, uh, there's no excuse for ignorance. Participants who took part in the event are happy with the service, explaining how they are now better equipped to deal with visa challenges. We've had several cases where an expatriate will come in with a TWP visa, and at the point of entrance, point of entry, which is at the international airport, they will stop a business visa and with an endorsement prohibited to work. You know, we've been having that issue. And oftentimes the expatriate is meant to stand for hours, you know, pass through some queries, the company is called upon. But I'm happy because the controller has been able to sort that out. This meeting served as a, a sensitization meeting so that all the company that has expatriate in Nigeria, you should have a free landing in doing business so that the expatriate would not have any issue when dealing with issues that has to do with the immigration educate uh, customers and clients on um, the right procedures and processes of STR, CEPAC and ETC so that um, in future or as it's, it is, people will not have issues of coming in or going out, especially the expatriates. It is now expected that challenges of visa for expatriates who work with both local and multinational companies will now become a thing of the past. The Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board JAMP is raising an alarm over publications in both print and online media celebrating certain candidates for obtaining high scores in the 2023 Unified Tertiary Matriculation Examination, UTME. The public statement obtained by Channels Television, the head of public affairs and protocol, Fabian Benjamin, explained that the results which most of these candidates are parading are fake. The statement cites a certain candidate, Ms. Ejikeme Joy Mesoma, who claims to have scored 362 in the 2023 UTME and was awarded a 3 million naira scholarship by the founder and CEO of Innocent Vehicle Manufacturing, Mr. Innocent Chukuma. It was, however, discovered that Ms. Ejikeme Joy had manipulated her UTME results to deceive the public after the board revealed she had actually scored 249 and not 362, as she claimed. The board says she will be prosecuted and her original result withdrawn. And going forward, it promises to investigate all candidates laying claim to higher scores than they actually obtained. The board then advises the public to always cross-check claims by candidates with the board before rushing to honor them with undeserving awards as certain software have been created to fake their version of their results and put same out in the public space, thereby defrauding good-spirited Nigerians to obtain scholarships and other recognitions. Nigeria is a signatory to the 2006 International Telecommunications Union Agreement in Geneva, Switzerland, on the transition from analog to digital broadcasting. Although Nigeria began the process two years later, not much has been achieved since signing the agreement 17 years ago. This next report examines the big issues in Nigeria's attempt to ensure complete digitization. Digitization should have been the game changer in Nigeria's broadcast industry. However, the delay in completing the process has set Nigeria back by at least 17 years. What is digitization and why is it such a big deal? It was um, a decision that was taken as far back as 2007 um, when it was decided that uh, for television to have uh, more channels, uh, there was a decision to um, abide with the new technology um, and that is um, switching from the analog to um, digital. What is the digital switch over? It's actually, it was actually an attempt to make sure that all the sub-regional operators, you know, the broadcasters, the telecoms com companies, they were able to interplay and uh, take over from one another. Six years after the nation signed up for the process, the federal government issued a white paper for the implementation of the migration process. 
The International Telecommunications Union took the decision to implement the migration because of the potential of scarcity of global spectrum for telecommunication firms. The Nigeria Communication Commission is expected to mop up the spectrum and sell to telecom companies who actually need it more. According to the 2012 White Paper, when digital switchover coverage hits at least 90%, the nation can switch off analog broadcast. Though the federal government would eventually launch the project on April 30, 2016, including at least five subsequent state capitals, no state in Nigeria has succeeded in achieving complete switchover. The federal government has shifted the deadline for the migration at least three times. The political will uh, is a major factor. Funding from government is a major factor. There is no country where they have achieved um, digital migration uh, from analog to, to digital that um, government did not uh, back it heavily. Government has not shown enough commitment. For example, they made promises of some billions of naira that were never granted. The initial stage of this project, the government is to finance it. That is what we call the seed grant given by government to uh, various stakeholders that are involved in this project. But as time goes on, we realize that it's not possible for government to finance in this project. Although there have been some release of funds, the stakeholders are asking for more funding. Yes, even though the National Broadcasting Commission reports that some monies were released for the purchase of set-up boxes for the first phase, the former Minister of Information, Mr. Lai Mohammed, is quoted as saying that the Federal Executive Council approved the sum of 9.4 billion naira as outstanding payment to key DSO stakeholders. It is still not clear how much has been spent so far on the project. The Nigeria Communications Commission has already sold the 700 and 800 megahertz spectrum, which houses most subnational television states and some private stations. In the meantime, television broadcasters have already been asked to vacate the 600 megahertz spectrum ahead of its planned sale. In March 2023, the Commission puts the broadcast frequency up for sale with alert plans to accelerate the migration. We are only able to cover eight states. But now we realize that it's not just going to state making ceremonies on that ceremony that matters, but how to get a very, very wide coverage. That's the most important. That's why we came up with the system of Simocrypt, whereby ITS and Star Times uh, will come together with uh, uh, what do you call them, the free TV uh, stakeholders to come up with one box and two cards, whereby you just buy a box and sometimes has massive infrastructure uh, across the country. So once this is achieved, we don't have to go step by step launching this. We just switch off DSO because the coverage will be there. There are consequences for delay in migrating, especially if neighboring countries achieve full digitization. This would affect television broadcasting in some parts of the country. The National Broadcasting Commission is hoping to work with the stakeholders to ensure a one-off launch of the process. And now to the arts. The beauty of traditional and contemporary art takes the spotlight in an exhibition done by the duo of father and son at the Terracultura Gallery in Lagos. Shegun and Benga Adeku present their joint show titled Orila Finju, which celebrates different techniques and methods applied by these two generations in producing their works of art. And we see it on Art Review tonight. Clipping, symbolistic of birds alongside the artist's statement, a part of the welcome party at this solo exhibition by contemporary artist Ayamfe Olarinde, organized by the African Artist Foundation in Lagos. My art 
is called um, Jagaism. Jagaism was coined from the word Jaga Jaga. Jaga Jaga, as we all know here in Nigeria, is um, means something haphazard, something um, loose, something scattered, something crooked. You get so basically, Jagaism was coined from was inspired by it um, by a time, a moment in my life where I felt like lots of people didn't really understand the style I was doing, um, which was scribble art, right? So I was just putting together lines, um, and a lot of people didn't really understand where I was headed with that. They didn't really know that. I was trying to create a piece. So yeah, most times I was getting the hate word of, um, oh yeah, this girl is doing jaga jaga, jaga jaga. As a way for me to become resistant to those things, I had to start calling myself jaga, um, a jagaism artist because yeah, it's actually where I was. I was always creating works from crooked lines, you guys. So basically it's like a therapeutic process of self-acceptance. <laughs> The artist put all her experiences from COVID to isolation to this moment in these images to display the need to break the shackles and urge to encounter the world. It's a show with a lot of emotions. If you, you see that there's a lot of like references to like family, friends, also loved ones that are lost. So it's uh, basically like a, a, a palette, a different palette of her emotions and her experiences in 2021. It's a global village, they say, and what happens at one end usually has a domino effect on others, despite the distance in between. These exhibits dissected through exploring the issue of identity, social reality, mental well-being and tradition. I don't try to impose what I want people to see when they see my work. Um, basically, I want people to experience themselves, experience whatever it is they wish to experience. Again, I don't like to impose feelings in um, the viewers of my art. For Larinde, there's only one race, the human race. So this graduate from the University of Lagos employs scribbling, photography, and multi-layered techniques to show that the world is your oyster, but free to move and fly. Outside our shores, the grandmother of 17-year-old Nahel M, who was killed during a traffic stop in France, says she wants riots currently going on as a result of the incident to stop. She was speaking to French network BFM television in Nanterre, the town where the incident took place. She says she resents the men who stopped and killed her grandson, but then she does not hate all other police officers. Her cries followed that from a number of government officials as cities across France joined in protesting Nahel's death, the teenager. Two people have been killed and 28 others injured in a mass shooting in Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States. The scene was a holiday weekend block party, according to local media. Police say an 18-year-old woman and a 20-year-old man were killed and three victims were in critical condition, with a suspect or suspects still at large. The tragedy has rattled the city at the start of the 4th of July holiday weekend, when Americans typically gather for parades, barbecues and fireworks. The shooting occurred shortly after midnight at the Brooklyn Day block party in the Brooklyn Homes neighborhood of Baltimore, which hundreds of people attend. Welcome to Sports News. Women's 100 meters hurdles world champion Tobia Mosson has won the women's event at the Stockholm Diamond League earlier this evening. Mosson clocked 12.52 seconds to win the race ahead of Ireland's Sarah Lavin, who clocked a personal best of 12.73 seconds to finish in second place. Poland's Pia Jakowska finished third in 12.78 seconds. This is the first win of the year in the Diamond League series for Mosson, who is no stranger to breaking records. Last week, she lost to Jasmine Camacho Quinn in Lausanne, tying her season's best time of 12.47 seconds, while the Olympic champion won in 12.40 seconds. Super Falcons forward Aziza Toshola says the team is motivated to put up an impressive performance at this month's FIFA Women's World Cup holding in Australia and New Zealand. The Barcelona Lady star believes the nine-time African champions can surpass the 1999 quarterfinal performance the best the Falcons have achieved at the World Cup. The team have departed the country for Australia for a 15-day training camp ahead of their opening game against Olympic champions Canada on July the 21st. And the main news again. 
The federal government has strongly rejected the European Union's conclusions on this year's general elections. It described the report from the EU as biased and largely unfounded. President Bola Tinubu has returned to the nation's capital, Abuja, to continue the business of tackling the challenges of governance after he spent five days in Lagos for the Eid holiday. That's the news at 10 tonight. Many thanks for watching. I'm Ayo Tunde Balogun.